All right, so we're back. Finishing up with Henry Huggins. I am in the middle of chapter three on page 65. And there's Henry and Ribsy. Henry has the football and here comes that car. I think Scooter's not gonna be happy, huh? The car raced on down the street and screeched around a corner on two wheels. The football was gone. The boys stared after the car. Henry was so surprised he stood there with his arm in the air. When he finally remembered to bring it down, he was still speechless. My football, exclaimed Scooter. He stopped looking down the street after the departed car. He looked at Henry. My ball is in that car, he said accusingly. Yeah, I guess it is. Henry was uncomfortable. Maybe the man in the car will bring it back in a little while, he said hopefully. He'd better, said Scooter grimly. The boys sat down on the curb to wait. Boy, I bet he was going 80 miles an hour, said Henry. I couldn't even see his license plates. He ought to be arrested, said Henry, who was anxious to talk about anything but Scooter's football. He might kill somebody, said Scooter. The boys waited and waited. The longer, the, wait, the, the longer they waited, the more angry Scooter looked. I don't think that car is gonna come back, he said finally. It's all your fault, you threw the ball. Yes, I know, admitted Henry. But it wasn't my fault that Ribsy barked and that that old car came by just then. You shouldn't have thrown it, Scooter scowled darkly. I couldn't help it, Henry scowled back. I didn't even see the car until after I threw the ball. I couldn't catch it after I had thrown it, could I? I don't care. You would have heard the car coming if that dumb dog of yours hadn't made so much noise. He wasn't even barking at anything. You lost my new ball and you're gonna have to buy me a new one. If you don't, I'll, I'll. Scooter wasn't quite sure what he would do, so he didn't finish the sentence. Henry didn't know what to say. It did not seem right that he was to blame. Still, half an hour ago, Scooter had a new football. Now it was gone, and Henry had been the last one to touch it. I have 46 cents and three milk bottles you could have, said Henry hopefully. He hated to see that football disappear almost as much as Scooter did. That isn't enough, said Scooter. You'll have to buy me a new football before next Saturday, or I'll tell my dad and he'll tell your dad, and then you'll really get it. Henry suspected Scooter was right. He probably would get it. Once, when he had accidentally broken another boy's roller skate, his father had gave him a talking to and then made him spend his allowance to have it fixed. Okay, he said, I'll get you a new football. I don't know how, but I guess I'll manage. Henry turned and went slowly into the house. Ribsy followed him. Now see what you've done, Henry said. And after I spent my football money for your license and your collar and your dish too, Ribsy hung his head. Now Henry was just twice as far from owning a real cowhide football with nylon stitching and buckskin lacings as he had been half an hour ago. He was quiet the rest of the afternoon and all through dinner. He was thinking. How about another piece of gingerbread? His father asked. No, thank you, said Henry absentmindedly. May I be excused, please? Why, Henry, don't you feel well? Mrs. Huggins was surprised. Henry usually ate two pieces of gingerbread and a third if she let him. Of course I feel all right, said Henry, and went out to sit on the front steps. Ribsy lay on the step below and dozed with his head on Henry's foot. Good old Ribsy, even if you did get me into trouble, said Henry. He listened to the whish-click, whish-click of the water sprinkler next door and wondered how he was going to earn $13.95 in one week. He thought and thought. He could collect old tin foil. No, that would take too long. Junkmen didn't want the little wads of tin foil that came from old cigarette packs. They wanted big pieces that were too hard to find. Maybe he could ask the neighbors for old papers and magazines. No. Nope. He had already collected all he could find for a school paper drive the week before. Besides, the junkmen paid only half a cent a pound. 
He could open a lemonade stand by the park, but lemonade stands were just kid stuff. Mothers and fathers were the only people who really spent any money for lemonade. He could charge 50 cents for mowing lawns. That would be a dollar for two lawns. He would have to mow 28 lawns to earn $13.95. Even if he could get 28 lawns to mow, he didn't see how he could find time after school. As the evening grew darker, Henry st still sat on the steps, thinking and listening to the whish-click, whish-click of the water sprinkler. Whish-click, whish-click. Then, Mr. Hector Grumby, who lived next door, came out of the house and shut off the water. Henry liked Mr. Grumby, but he wasn't so sure about Mrs. Grumby. She sprinkled Doggy Be Gone on her shrubbery, and Ribsy disliked the smell very much. Henry noticed that Mr. Grumby had a flashlight in one hand and a quart fruit jar in the other. Mr. Grumby set the jar on the sidewalk, tiptoed onto the lawn, flashed his light on the grass, bent over, and pounced on something. Then he picked it up and put it into the jar. It was too dark for Henry to see what it was. The next time Mr. Grumby pounced, he didn't put anything into the jar. Henry heard him mutter, oops, that one got away. Henry couldn't stand it any longer. He had to know what Mr. Grumby was doing. He walked across his own lawn and peered over the rose bushes. If you come any closer, said Mr. Grumby, you'd better tiptoe. I don't want to scare him away. Scare what away? asked Henry. Night crawlers, said Mr. Grumby. Night crawlers, exclaimed Henry. What are night crawlers? Worms, said Mr. Grumby. Great big worms. Do you mean to say you've lived here all these years and never seen a night crawler? No, I haven't, answered Henry. How big are they? Oh, about seven to ten inches long. Golly, Henry could hardly believe it. Ten inches long? I didn't know worms came that big. Here's one. Mr. Grumby swooped and held up a worm in the beam of his flashlight. It was a big, fat worm. And there's Mr. Grumby with Henry looking over. And see that little worm? <sighs> it was at least nine inches long and as big as round as a pencil. Wow, said Henry. It was hard to believe, but there it was. Mr. Grumby put it into the jar. Do you use them to catch fish? Asked Henry. That's right, Mr. Grumby pounced again. What kind of fish? Well, some kinds of trout, salmon, perch, catfish, different kinds of fish. I'm going salmon fishing in the Columbia River in the morning. Henry thought this over. Do you always catch worms at night? Yes. They only come out at night when the ground is wet. I give the lawn a good soaking so they'll come up to the top. Then I turn on the light and grab them quick before they have a chance to pull back into the ground. Mrs. Grumby stepped out on the porch and called to her husband. Hector, if you expect me to have lunch ready for you to take fishing at three o'clock in the morning, you'd better go to the store for a loaf of bread right now before it closes. All right, in a minute. As his wife went back into the house, Mr. Grumby said to Henry, how would you like to earn some money? Catching worms? I'll say I would. I'll pay you a penny apiece for every night crawler you catch. Golly, said Henry, a penny apiece? How many do you want? As many as you can catch. If I can't use them, some of the other men can. He handed Henry the jar and the flashlight, got into his car and drove away. A penny a piece. There were 100 pennies and a dollar, so it would take 1,395 worms to pay for the football and 41 worms for the tax. Henry went around the rose bushes and tiptoed across the grass. Because of the doggy be gone, Ribsy stayed on his own side of the rose bushes. Henry turned on the flashlight, and sure enough, there on the grass was the end of a big fat worm. But when Henry bent to pick it up, it was gone. He tiptoed farther across the grass and turned on the light again. This time he moved faster. He grabbed the end of the cold, slippery worm. The other end was already in the ground. Henry pulled and the worm pulled. The worm stretched, it grew longer and thinner until it snapped out of Henry's hand and disappeared into the ground. Ugh, said Henry. 
The next time he moved still faster. He pounced on the worm before either end had a chance to get into the ground. He caught it. That's one penny, he thought. And there's Henry catching worms, putting them in his jar. After that, it was easier. He caught most of the worms on the first pounce. Pretty soon, he had caught 62 worms. Then he discovered he was running out of worms. Either he had caught all of Mr. Grumby's worms, or they had felt him walking around on the ground and had retired for the night, and he had not earned enough to pay for the football. Just as Henry was wondering where he could find more worms, Mr. Grumby came back from the store. I caught 62 worms for you, said Henry. 62? That's great. Mr. Grumby reached into his pants pocket and brought out a handful of change. He picked out a 50 cent piece, a dime, and two pennies and gave them to Henry. Thank you, said Henry politely. He wished he had caught more worms. Mr. Grumby started to go into the house and then stopped. Say, Shorty, he said to Henry, who was going back through the rose bushes. I'll tell you what you can do. Sunday morning, I'm going fishing with a bunch of men from my lodge. Quite a few of us are going and we can use all the worms you can catch. Tomorrow night, you get someone to help you and catch enough for all of us. Sure, said Henry eagerly. I'll catch hundreds of worms for you. Swell, we can use them, answered Mr. Grumpy as he went into the house. Henry sat down on his front steps again. Because he needed so much money, he knew he would have to catch all the worms himself. That meant he would need a lot of wet lawn. His mother would be pleased, even surprised, to have him water the lawn. But his lawn and the Grumby's lawn wouldn't be enough. Maybe he could ask all the people on the street to water their yards Saturday evening. However, if he did that, Beezus and Robert and the other kids would ask what he was doing. Henry was afraid they would want to earn money catching worms too. He knew Beezus would want to. She was the kind of girl who would like catching worms. Henry sat on the steps, wishing he had acres and acres of wet lawn. He thought and thought about millions of wet green blades of grass with big fat worms peeping out from under them. The park, of course that was it. It was only a few blocks away, and because September had been unusually warm this year, the grass in the park was watered every day. If his mother would let him stay up later than nine o'clock, he knew he could catch enough worms to pay for the football. Henry went into the living room where his mother was knitting an argyle sock. Mom, could I stay up later tomorrow night? Henry told his mother the whole story. Mrs. Huggins put down the sock. Henry, she sighed, how do you manage to get yourself into such messes? Well, gee, said Henry, I didn't do anything. I just threw this football in. Yes, you told me, his mother interrupted. Yes, you may stay up tomorrow night, but for goodness sake, Henry, after this, do be careful with other people's belongings. Saturday was an anxious day for Henry. He wanted to avoid Scooter, but he also wanted to go to the park to make sure the grass was being watered. Unfortunately, he had to pass Scooter's house to reach the park. He walked on the other side of the street, but Scooter was in his front yard tightening the chain on his bicycle. He shook his fist at Henry and yelled, you get me that ball or I'll fix you. You and who else? Henry yelled back and kept on going. When he reached the park, he was relieved to hear the swish of the sprinklers and see the water spraying over the grass. He would earn $13.95 before he went to bed that night. That evening, Henry didn't wait for dessert. He borrowed his father's flashlight and several old mayonnaise jars and ran down the hill to the park. It was a warm night and the tennis courts and swimming pool were floodlighted. It was only beginning to get dark, but Henry hoped it might be dark enough under the bushes to start catching worms. He couldn't afford to waste time. He passed the playground where he heard the children's shouts and the clank and clang of the rings and swings. Henry didn't stop. He had work to do. He went to the edge of the park where there were no lights and turned on his flashlight. Sure enough, there in the grass under a bush was a night crawler. Henry nabbed it and put it into his jar. Then he caught another. 
He caught worm after worm. 431, 432, 433. Henry was tired of pouncing. Henry was tired of worms. When the lights of the swimming pool went off, Henry was still working. By the time that the lights at the tennis courts went off, Henry was very, very tired of worms. But he kept on. When he had added the 1,103rd worm to his collection, he heard someone calling, Henry, Henry, where are you? It was his mother. Here I am. As Henry stood up to rest his aching back, he saw his mother and father walking along the path. My goodness, Henry, Mrs. Huggins exclaimed. Haven't you caught those worms yet? You can't stay out in the park alone all night. But mom, I don't have enough worms to pay for Scooter's football, and I promise to get him a new one this week. I have 1,103 worms, and I need to catch 1,331 altogether. I had some money saved, and I earned some last night. Let's see. He needs 228 more. It shouldn't take long to catch them, Mr. Huggins said to Mrs. Huggins. After all, he promised. Let's help him. So Henry and his mother and father bent and pounced together. Henry felt a little uncomfortable to see his mother catching worms, but he was very, very glad when the 1,331st worm was in the jar. He took his jars of worms to Mr. Grumby, who paid him $13.31. As Henry watched him turn the night crawlers into a box of dirt so they would live until Sunday, he thought he never wanted to see another worm. He felt the money in his pocket. I guess this ought to take care of old Scooter, he said, and wishing he could spend it on a football for himself, he went home to bed. Sunday morning, Henry lay on his stomach on the living room floor reading the funny papers. Usually, he woke up early and read the funnies before his mother and father were awake, but this morning, he was so tired from catching worms that he slept later than usual. The doorbell rang and Mr. Huggins, who was reading the sports section and drinking coffee, put down his paper and answered the door. Henry heard a strange man ask, excuse me, could you tell me who owns this football? Henry didn't wait for his father to answer. He ran to the door. And when Henry got to the door, what did he see? But a man holding the football. I'll bet Henry was excited. Where do you think that football came from? The man was holding Scooter's real cowhide football, stitched with nylon thread and laced with buckskin thongs. Golly, said Henry, that's the football I lost for Scooter McCarthy. The man handed it to Henry. I'm sorry I couldn't stop when the ball landed in my car. I had to take my wife to the hospital in a hurry. I would have returned it sooner, but I couldn't leave the kids. That's okay, said Henry. Gee, thanks for bringing it back. When the man had gone, Henry showed the football to his father. See, Dad, he said, this is the kind of football I'm going to buy with my night crawler money. Then he tucked the football under his arm as if he were running 90 yards for a touchdown and sprinted down the street to Scooter's house. And that is the end of chapter three.